we are coming on the air with new details about what prosecutors are calling a premeditated mass shooting on the New York City subway with the suspect behind bars tonight after being denied bail. Ahead, what we're hearing, law enforcement found in a storage unit belonging to Frank James and the clues his public defender is giving about what comes next. Plus, Russia now saying that massive warship that may or may not have been struck by a Ukrainian missile just sank in the Black Sea. How it could point toward a maritime phase in this war. An outrage in Michigan after video is emerging of a white officer shooting a black man in the back of the head during a traffic stop. What we're hearing from activists on the ground and members of the community. Plus, Elon Musk's making what he says his best and final offer to buy Twitter and take it private. He says it's to preserve free speech, but there are some who don't want that deal to happen at all. We'll get into it. And online dating. You know, it's hard enough without having to deal with scammers, but we've got an NBC News exclusive look at how some people are swindling suitors into trying to buy, get this, cryptocurrency. How the FBI is tracking these folks down later in the show. Hi, everybody. I'm Tom Costello in for Hallie Jackson. Tonight, the suspect in the Brooklyn subway shooting is learning he is going to be held in jail without bail until his possible trial. That's a sketch right there of Frank James, who appeared in a federal courtroom today. He faces life in prison for what our Pete Williams calls the, quote, train wrecking statute, basically an attack on a mass transportation system where the lives of passengers were at risk. New, new details coming up from the prosecutors show we had a, quote, stockpile of ammunition in his storage unit, calling the attack premeditated. Today, his court-appointed public defender is saying what happened Tuesday was horrible, but refusing to say whether she believes he carried out the shooting. What happened in the New York City subway system on Tuesday was a tragedy. It is a blessing that it was not worse. Mr. James is entitled to a fair trial, and we will ensure that he receives one. His public defender there, she did confirm James made that Crime Stoppers call that led to his arrest, although a law enforcement source tells NBC News police were already closing in. Our team in the courtroom says his legal team is asking for a mental health evaluation. As a reminder, 62 years old, accused of shooting 10 people at Brooklyn 36th Street subway station, hurting 13 others, five of those victims are still in the hospital. Our Antonia Hilton is outside the courthouse. Antonia, good afternoon. Tell us more about what happened in the courtroom, including how the prosecutors are laying out their arguments. Good evening, Tom. So just before 1 p.m., Frank James made his first appearance in court, appearance in court, and was, you know, advised of the charges against him for this gruesome attack on Tuesday morning. He did not speak for the most part. He nodded along at points, acknowledging that he understood that he was being charged for this federal crime, and he was flanked by his two public defenders. And they shied away, as you mentioned, from giving any indication of whether or not, or how they're going to make their defense, or whether or not Frank is going to admit to having been involved in this attack. Uh, the prosecutors, though, really made their position quite clear that they believe that this was premeditated. They said that he caused terror and disruptions on public transit, not just for the victims who were in that car with him on that train that morning, but for people throughout the entire city of New York that day. And then shortly after it ended, the two public defenders representing Frank James came out here and spoke to all of us, the reporters here on the ground, and said what some of what you just showed in that clip there, essentially acknowledging that he did call Crime Stoppers on himself, but they said to help, which was an interesting indication of potentially where uh, the defense may go. As you mentioned, they are also asking for a psychiatric evaluation. They also asked for other health supplements to be made available to James in the coming days while he is in detention. And so it gives some indication of potentially how they may be planning to defend their client, but there's still so much we don't understand about this man and what transpired that morning, Tom. Okay, so we know about the federal charge right now, but is James expected to face any New York state charges as well? 
that's very possible. So he has this one charge now. State charges are possible. To give an example of what that could look like, it would look like potentially, you know, a charge for bringing firearms across state lines. But this one charge that he's currently facing, if convicted, would likely lead to him already being behind bars for the rest of his life, Tom. Okay, Antonia, thank you. Antonia Hilton in New York City. Uh, turning now to Ukraine, where just moments ago, Russia is saying a missile cruise ship that's been on fire all day in the Black Sea just sank while being towed to a port. Here's a look now at some old video of that ship. Ukraine says its forces attacked it with missiles just off the coast of Odessa, and they're claiming it is a major win. Russia's Ministry of Defense is just blaming it, though, on a fire on board. That's as the attacks are ramping up in eastern Ukraine, uh, like in Kharkiv. You can see the damage there with what appear to be homes completely blown out by the shelling. Ali Rusi is in Lviv. And Ali, the Pentagon's John Kirby told us today that Russia's naval impact on the war so far has been limited. So give us the Ukrainian perspective. Why would this attack be so important to the Ukrainians? Hi, Tom. Well, there's several reasons for that. First, it's a big boost to the Ukrainian army, to the Ukrainian people to sink a Russian warship. And, of course, that was a flagship. Uh, it, the control and command was on board that ship. They would, you could use ships like that for supplying ground forces. And, of course, a ship like that is a massive piece of floating territory for the Russians. You don't usually hear a lot about these ships until they're hit like this. So for a, for a flagship Russian vessel to be at the bottom of the Black Sea right now really doesn't look good for the Russian war effort. It shows that the Ukrainians can outsmart them, hit them with uh, anti-ship missiles, uh, and that the war effort is not going in the direction they want. It's a big embarrassment for them. It's a ship that they were always very proud of and one that was serving an important purpose for the Russians here. So it's a big morale blow for the Russians and a big boost for the Ukrainians here. Okay, so also the New York Times is reporting that Europe is now moving towards an oil embargo on Russia. Um, and they have been, as you know, struggling to get everybody in lockstep on this issue. So how big of a blow would that be to Russia and how much of a boost to Ukraine? Well, it's going to be a huge blow to Russia. Look, they supply roughly 40 percent of Europe's gas. In Germany, that goes up to 50 percent. Uh, and if you want to look at it from the beginning of this war, look, the European Union have given the Russia, uh, have given the Ukrainians about a billion and a half dollars worth of military aid. But in that same time period, they've given the Russians about 60 billion dollars. That's a billion dollars mm -hmm. a day of buying Russian energy uh, from from European money. And that billion dollars a day funds the Russian war machine. It's a lot of money for them to do what they're doing here. Yeah, such a crucial point. Listen, speaking of Russian reaction, we've now got the Kremlin today saying that if the Baltic countries, uh, if they decide to go towards NATO uh, and they are nuclear, that could be a real problem. Finland right now talking about going into NATO. Uh, give us an, a situation on where that stands right now and, and how this would impact Vladimir Putin's plans. Uh, look, and it, it's backfiring badly on Vladimir Putin. This is exactly what he didn't want to happen. The Russian foreign ministry in December 2021 put a lot of pressure on Finland and Sweden not to join NATO. They said it would have uh, military and political consequences. And the last thing the Russians want is Finland, which shares a border with Russia, becoming a NATO country because then U.S. armament could go there. And this is not what Vladimir Putin wanted, but he's pushed these countries into joining a NATO because they're scared. They don't want what's happened to Ukraine to happen to them. Yeah, good point. Ali, thank you. Ali Rusi. Uh, President Biden coming back from North Carolina, where he was pushing a plan he hopes will help bring down the massive inflation that's costing all of us a lot more for just about everything. He spoke at North Carolina A&T, uh, the largest historically black university in America, promoting legislation the administration says will boost U.S. competitiveness in the tech field. And his speech is coming at a time when manufacturing slowdowns are only worsening the supply chain crisis and pushing prices even higher on food, on gas, on a whole lot more. Here's how President Biden is selling this legislation. Listen here. When we build more in America, we increase economic capacity, and ultimately it helps lower everyday prices for families. That's what we're starting to see. Look around. American manufacturing is coming back. 
Let's bring in Mike Memoli. Uh, Mike, explain how the president thinks Congress can solve the country's inflation problems. This is a big ask. Yeah, that's right, Tom. One of the pieces of legislation that the president is trying to move forward is it has different names in the House or Senate version that they're trying to bring together at the moment. It's either the CHIPS Act or the Competes Act. The bottom line is trying to deal with one of the major pandemic related supply chain challenges we have, especially as it relates to semiconductors, advanced manufacturing, these chips that are so, so integral in everyday life at this point. And what the president is pushing is legislation that would really increase the federal incentivization for these semiconductor chips. We've already seen a number of companies like Intel announcing plans to expand their U.S. operations if this legislation were to pass. And the president went to North Carolina, an area that has seen manufacturing decline in the past as a place he toured a robotics facility, in fact, where there is a market and a, and a workforce that is ready and willing to take some of these jobs of the 21st century. So building these uh, semiconductor chips and advancing the uh, production of these kinds of materials here in the U.S. will uh, end the need to invest, uh, to depend on China, excuse me, uh, where we saw some of those supply chain lead to increased prices here at home. But of course, we're still waiting for the House and the Senate to come to an agreement on this framework, and that's really where the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, and, and fixing the domestic uh, chip supply issue is not going to be overnight. Uh, so the White House clearly sees this inflation, 8.5%, is a very big political factor ahead of the midterms, just based on polling. Uh, can you talk about how much is on the line when it comes to voters and their finances, and the voters always blame whatever White House is in power for their pocketbook issues? Yeah, our recent NBC poll and a new CNBC poll today found the same thing, which is that voters are saying that the cost of living is their number one concern. Now, what has the president really been focused on for the most part in the last month and a half? Ukraine. So much of his private schedule, but also his public schedule has been dealing with responding to issues overseas. And so it was interesting, Tom, that we saw the president today doing something he hasn't done since November, which is for the second time leaving Washington to have an event about his domestic agenda, talking not just about this piece of legislation, the CHIPS Act, but other actions that his administration is trying to take to lower everyday costs, including the steps he's taken, for instance, on gas prices. It's critical for Biden to get out into the country, especially as he was supporting Democratic candidates, the local congressmen from the area as well, who need this kind of backup from the administration, from the president, to show that they're trying to do everything they can. Okay, Mike, Mike, thank you. Mike Memoli. Uh, other news now, Pfizer BioNTech announcing today that a booster dose of its vaccine is working well in kids ages 5 to 11. In a small clinical trial, the company said the additional dose led to a 36-fold increase in antibodies against the Omicron variant of the virus. Right now, only those 12 and older can get the Pfizer booster. Younger children, except for those who are immunocompromised, are not yet eligible for a third shot. But Pfizer says it's going to submit its data to the FDA soon for emergency use Authorization. We're going to bring in now CNBC's Meg Terrell. Meg, uh, that clinical trial for the booster included about 140 kids. Walk us through what parents need to know, what parents need to know about this development and what it could mean for their children. Yeah, Tom, so essentially we were expecting to see these data and health experts have been saying based on what we understand about the vaccines, particularly in this era of Omicron, that it was expected that kids in this age group would need a third dose. And so what we saw from this relatively small trial is that a third dose, as expected, did increase antibody levels and didn't show any new safety issues. Of course, what we don't know is how long that protection is going to last and what exactly it's going to translate to in terms of vaccine effectiveness in in the real world. But we do know that when antibody levels go up, that generally mm -hmm. bodes well for adding protection. All right. Well, in February, New York State's Department of Health researchers reported uh, two dozen uh, of the, uh, two doses rather of the Pfizer vaccine offered little protection against the infection in children in this age group. So what if anything has changed? Well, what's changed is that Pfizer has done the study now and has the three-dose data. That study really did uh, lead to the conclusion that you probably do need a third dose in this age group as we do for the other age groups. And so uh, now we have this three-dose data. We don't have the real-world efficacy. That's what trials like that that you just talked about will show us. Uh, but we do know that this should add an increased level of protection on top of those two doses, which really did look like over time you did lose some of that protection. Yeah, and now the question every parent 
parent wants an answer to. Do we have an idea what the timeline looks like? How soon might we see boosters, boosters rather, into the arms of these young children? Yeah, so as you mentioned, Pfizer is going to be filing within the next few days with the FDA, and then we'll just have to see how quickly the regulators act. Tom, of course, a lot of parents are waiting for data for kids under the age of five, so the FDA is going to be weighing these things potentially around the same time. We'll just have to see what the timelines look like, but potentially over the next weeks and months. Good. Meg, thank you. Meg Terrell. The parents of a black man shot and killed by a white police officer last week are pleading for justice today, saying their hearts are broken because of the loss of their son. This just one day after the Grand Rapids Police Department in Michigan released disturbing video of the final moments of 26-year-old Patrick La Jolla's life. Listen. <laughs> I was thinking maybe it was my son who was going to bury me. He will assist at my funeral. But what is so astonishing, I am the one burying my son. Apa naona sina maisha nimesikia roho yangu kabisa imevunjika. I see that I have no life. I see my heart being broken. Naomba sheria. I'm asking for justice. Naomba sheria. I'm asking for justice. Naomba sheria. I'm asking for justice. The deadly shooting happened during a traffic stop on April 4th. La Jolla was pulled over and stepped out of the car. Then he tries to run, prompting a struggle between him and the officer. We want to warn you, the video you're about to see here is disturbing. Uh, in the moments before the shooting, the two appear to fight over the officer's taser, which the officer seems to have unholstered. The officer yells at La Jolla multiple times, drop it. Then the officer shoots him in the back of the head. Portions of the video were blurred by the police department for privacy. The officer has not been publicly identified and is on paid leave as state police now conduct the investigation. The city's police chief says the department is committed to operating with full transparency and accountability to make sure justice prevails. His words. Megan Fitzgerald joins me now. Uh, Megan, activists who are frustrated, some of them grieving, are saying that La Jolla's death comes after years of inaction on policing issues, talk to us about what's been happening in that city in particular. Yeah, Tom, that's absolutely right. Uh, these protesters are frustrated. They say that they have been sounding the alarm, so to speak, for years on instances where they say police have not been treating the public right. Uh, they refer to many incidents, including in 2017, when officers were trying to locate a middle-aged woman and ended up putting in handcuffs an 11-year-old girl and holding her at gunpoint. Uh, the officers in that situation weren't held accountable. Uh, they also refer to uh, just months earlier uh, and, and how officers held at gunpoint these teenage boys who were innocent. Uh, and then most recently in 2020, uh, they say that there are many complaints there of the way in which these officers were treating these protesters as they took to the streets. And here we are again, they say, uh, in another scenario that they believe could have been avoided, Tom. Yeah, the city manager of Grand Rapids ha has warned that the videos would lead to expressions of shock, of anger, of pain. Some downtown businesses, I guess, have boarded up their storefronts, and there are concrete barricades in parts of the city with police around them, and those barricades around police headquarters. H have we heard yep. yet from activists? But what others are we hearing? Who else are we hearing from in the community? Yeah, so, Tom, you know, to, to what you had just talked about, we talked to city officials, and they say they did that out of, of an abundance of caution. But at the moment, everything has remained peaceful, and that's what these protesters are calling for. Uh, they don't want to detract from the message that they're, they're trying to send out. They want meaningful change within the police department. They want justice, they say, for Patrick uh, Leoya. They want to make sure uh, that this officer is held accountable for, for these actions, they say. And so any looting or or violence they fear would take away from that message. Um, because many protesters, we hear them saying time and time again uh, that enough is enough, Tom. Yeah. Michigan State Police, I guess, are going to hand over their findings in this investigation to the Kent County prosecutor, who will ultimately decide if the officer faces criminal charges. What, what kind of evidence, though, are they looking for, and how long could this process take? 
Well, as far as the timeline is concerned, that we don't know. We, we did talk to the police chief yesterday of Grand Rapids, and he says that this is still in the early stages of the investigation. We know that the Grand Rapids Police Department is conducting their own internal investigation. Of course, it's the Michigan State Police that is leading the investigation. They're going to be coming through every frame of video. We know that there were four different uh, videos that were capturing the images leading up to the shooting, showing different angles. They're going to be going through that. Uh, there's several witnesses that they'll be talking to. There was someone inside the car uh, with Patrick Leoa. And also, there were people that came outside of their house when they heard uh, this disturbance happening outside. They will be speaking with those people as well. Um, as far as uh, naming this officer, the chief was clear. He said, look, I'm not willing to release his name unless he is charged. And at this point, uh, there's no indication of when we will learn uh, whether or not charges will be brought against him. Okay, Tom. Megan, Megan, thank you, Megan Fitzgerald. Coming up, inside El Salvador's gang wars, our own Gotti, Gotti Schwartz spoke to people who are stuck in, in a time of violence and uncertainty. Also, Elon Musk says Twitter, quote, needs to be transformed. How? He thinks buying it is a good start. How that's going over with the people in the company, coming up next. Happening right now, Twitter is reportedly holding an all-hands meeting with employees to discuss Elon Musk's offer to buy the company. Musk spoke out just a few hours ago at the TED 2022 conference saying he wants to buy Twitter for the sake of free speech and democracy. Here he is. I'm not saying this is the, I have all the answers here, um, but I, I, I do think that we want to be just very reluctant to delete things and, and have um, just just be very cautious with 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 per permanent bans. Uh, you know, t timeouts I think are better or, uh, than, than than sort of permanent bans. Of course, President Trump was permanently banned last month. Musk became Twitter's largest shareholder. He later agreed to join his board of directors, a move that was quickly reversed in just a matter of days. Musk is offering $54 per share. That would value the social media giant at north of $40 billion. He says this is his best and final offer. And if it's not accepted, he'll need to reconsider his options and position as a shareholder. Let's bring in CNBC's Julia Borston to talk about this. Julia, I watched this whole thing. Uh, he also said he does have a plan B, but he wouldn't talk about it. Do you have any idea how this, is, this offer is going over with the board of directors right now? And what are we to make of, of his veiled threat? A plan B, but he won't talk about it. Well, I think there's also a veiled threat that he's going to walk, and then that would send Twitter shares lower. There are so many different factors at play here, but there have been multiple reports that the board is not happy about this offer. Twitter already had to deal with an activist investor in Elliott. They have a new CEO who only started a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. Investors, um, the public is really not familiar with this new CEO, Prague Agarwal, and they have a plan in place. The company has laid out some very ambitious goals, targets they want to hit, both in terms of revenue and in terms of users. And the company feels like they have a plan in place to get there. This is a lot about introducing new potential revenue streams through subscriptions, making the, the whole product easier to use. Um, a safer place with less harassment. Uh, and, and these are all things that the company felt good about. The fact that Elon Musk wants to come in there, he has said very publicly that he's opposed to Twitter being ad reliant. And of course, well over 90% of Twitter's revenue is from ads. So there are a lot of questions about what Twitter would actually look like if Elon Musk were in charge. And I think that's one reason why we could expect some pushback from the board. And it's worth noting, the board could take this company and offer it to other potential suitors. Yeah, he he is the richest person in the world, and he's put up what some say is a good offer, but others make the point, listen, $54 a share when the stock has traded in the 70s in the, in the past 12 months may not be a great offer, actually. So uh, give us a sense of, you know, if this doesn't come together, and by the way, if he were to make the deal happen, he'd have to sell some Tesla shares to make the, the uh, Twitter deal work. So both stocks sank today on Wall Street. Um, where does this go from here? Do you get any sense of how the employees are reacting to this? 
Well, look, I, I'm sure we'll we'll get some leaks from the employee meeting. But I think the hilarious thing about this week is this was supposed to be a focus week for Twitter employees. They had Monday off, and this week was supposed to be low on meetings so employees could focus on their longer-term projects. And I'm sure when they woke up this morning and saw this news, they thought this isn't a very good way to focus. I mean, there are any number of ways this could play out. I think that there are also the regulatory hurdles and the mm. fact that Musk did not necessarily file uh, his his SEC filings explaining when he had bought certain numbers of shares, and there's going to be an investigation into that. So there are many different hurdles that have to um, th that he would have to jump over in order to bring this deal to completion. But we could expect the board to see if there are any other companies, such as Salesforce, which have been interested in buying Twitter in the past, see if they would perhaps be willing to buy more. Um, there's been some speculation that a private equity firm might want to come in. And there's also this thing called a poison pill that the company could adopt to help protect them from this kind of uh, hostile bid, if you will, from an Elon Musk. He really did allude to the fact that this isn't about, it's not necessarily a money-making deal. It's more about his passion for Twitter. And he loves Twitter. He loves the tweets. And he's, he's all in on this, you know, we don't want to silence anybody at all ever on Twitter. Yes, he is all about making it Twitter the open, free, the town, the global town square, as Twitter has often described itself. But what was interesting is in that that TED interview, he made it very clear this was not about him turning a profit. And yeah. so that raises the question of if he's going to look for a financial partner to come in and help buy out this company, how are they going to be operating this company? Is it if it's not going to be, say, relying on advertising, how many subscribers that will they really be able to get? And his lack of interest in profitability his interest in perhaps running it more like a nonprofit does raise questions about which type of financial partner would be willing to join him on this. Because you're right, he could pay for this himself, but he would have to sell some Twitter shares. Yeah. I'm sorry, Andrew, some Tesla shares. Some Tesla, Tesla, Tesla shares. Right. Tesla shares. Uh, Julia, thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. Julia Borston. All right, let's get you over to the five things our team thinks that you should know about tonight, dinner hour. Number one, a British national was convicted today for his role in an ISIS hostage scheme over a decade ago that led to the death of four Americans. Ashia, they start that again, Al Shahi Fil Shakti was found guilty on all counts after a jury concluded he was one of four Islamic state captors nicknamed the Beatles. He faces up to a life sentence in prison. Number two, a January 6th rioter who said he wanted the approval of former President Trump was found guilty by a jury just a short time ago. Dustin Thompson admitted to stealing a coat rack and a bottle of liquor from the Capitol. He said he got sucked into an online conspiracy theory and theories and was looking for Mr. Trump's respect. Thompson is one of nearly 800 defendants charged in connection with the insurrection. Number three, Delta Airlines has ended a health insurance surcharge on its unvaccinated employees. Workers without their shots had to pay an extra $200 a month for insurance. The company's CEO says they dropped the policy because they believe COVID is now a, quote, seasonal virus. Number four, Amazon will start charging sellers, sellers, a 5% fuel and inflation surcharge. The new fee is a first in the company's history, with Amazon saying, it's done everything it can to fight rising costs. Retail experts say this could mean customers will have to pay more for products down the road as well. And number five, the largest comet ever seen is making its way through our solar system. Astronomers say it's got a solid center, more than twice the width of Rhode Island. It's traveling at about 22,000 miles per hour toward the sun. Don't worry, it won't pass anywhere near all of us here on Earth. Right now, El Salvador is in the middle of a nationwide 30-day state of emergency that might be getting extended or even longer. The country put this in place after, last, after this month after a killing spree left 87 people dead in a single weekend. Something populist President Nayib Bukele is blaming on criminal gangs like MS-13 and Barrio 18. So his administration is fighting back, recently sending police and military units out to arrest over 11,000 alleged gang members in a two-week span. But human rights groups have some issues over how he's going about clamping down on criminals, like making fun of gang members on social media, arresting gang members on social media, reducing the amount of food prisoners get to just two meals a day, 
And some are also saying he's silencing critics and journalists just to consolidate his power. These sweeping laws are allowing authorities to do whatever they want. Gotti Schwartz, just back from El Salvador, and he joins me now. So, Gotti, talk us through this. El Salvador has been hitting uh, record numbers uh, of violence in the last few weeks. What's driving it now? Is it the same old issue of, of guns and drugs and violence and gangs? Well, there's the guns and drugs and violence and gangs, but there's also this huge spike that we saw. So uh, for quite some time now, El Salvador went from being one of the most violent countries on planet Earth to having a relatively low homicide rate uh, after the uh, uh, Bukele came into office. And that was something that he was proud of, something that he touted uh, pretty frequently, the president there. And then all of a sudden, about three weeks ago, there was this incredibly violent weekend that you talked about. In one day alone, there were 62 deaths. So internally uh, in the country of El Salvador, there was some talk that maybe the gangs were at war. Maybe there was some secret agreement between the president and the gangs that was being renegotiated. Uh, regardless of what actually happened, uh, that spike in crime really sent the president in overdrive when it came to cracking down on gangs. And he has been very uh, forceful in his messaging on Twitter uh, and basically making fun of these gang members as often as he can. Can, and he's made so far 11,000 uh, 11, arrests. So here's where there's a little bit of a breakdown. In El Salvador, he is being hailed a hero. His approval rating is somewhere like 85 to 90 percent. And that's because he's really weaponized uh, the term homeboy which used to strike fear into the hearts of some people in El Salvador. Now he uses it in the diminutive. He almost uh, says things like, oh, you're, you're worried about your homeboys, or oh, are you defending your homeboys, or your homeboys in jail aren't going to see the light of day or not see any sunshine. So he's, he's making fun of uh, these gang members and going after them in a way that uh, Salvadorians have never seen. And so they support their president, even though from the outside world it may appear heavy-handed. And then you've got Human Rights Watch and others saying, yeah, but uh, what about due process? Yeah, now you do, you've also been talking to just regular everyday Salvadorans uh, down there who've been living through this. And what are they saying? What's it like to live through this just spasm of violence? Well, we were down there, and interestingly enough, a lot of the Salvadorans we spoke to said that they felt safer right now when he's at war with the gangs than they have in quite some time because he is on the offensive and they are on the defense. And they can see that through those homicide rates. So we had that 62 people killed in one day to now zero to one homicide to zero homicides in the entire country of El Salvador. So they feel a little bit emboldened. And in fact, when I was down in El Salvador, it was the first time somebody had ever talked to me like this with the camera, knowing that we were filming uh, and willing to put their face on television, this one man said, I cannot wait until the soldiers and the, military, and the police come to my neighborhood and arrest the gang members that charge me $5 a week just to sell little candies on the street. He was paying uh, what they call renta down there, which is this extortion mm -hmm. money to the gangs. And so uh, Nayib Bukele has been very adamant about um, posting uh, almost as many pictures as he can of these uh, these these gang members that they are arresting. And then a lot of times you hear about the stories that these are the people that were collecting that extortion. All right, real quickly, Gotti, uh, is, is there any indication that he's kind of borrowing a page, an authoritarian type page from next door in Nicaragua, from Daniel Ortega? I think we're in uncharted territory with Twitter. So much of this, these battles are, are happening over Twitter, and he's using it uh, on one hand as propaganda, on another hand as a way to fire back at the United States when the human rights organizations in the United States has uh, issued concerns over uh, due process. He said things like, oh, well, I have a journalist friend that wants to go into Guantanamo Bay and interview the detainees there. These are our terrorists. You have your terrorists. Stay out of El Salvador affairs. And that's something that's resonating there uh, within the population. One of NBC's best, Gotti Schwartz. Thanks, buddy. Nice to see you. Appreciate it. Uh, you can watch more of Gotti's reporting uh, on tonight on NBC Nightly News, 630 on the East Coast and various time zones wherever you live. When we come back, an NBC News exclusive, the rise of online romance scams involving cryptocurrency, what the FBI is doing about it. And day four of Johnny Depp's defamation trial against his ex-wife, Amber Heard, what their marriage counselor said about their relationship. That story's coming up.
Dysfunctional and volatile. That's what Johnny Depp and Amber Heard's former marriage counselor had to say about their relationship in a Virginia courtroom today on day four of this high profile defamation trial. Uh, Laurel Anderson called the two actors mutually abusive in a recorded video deposition to the jury. The former couple, couple started seeing her back in 2015. Depp is suing Heard for $50 million, saying his ex falsely portrayed him as a domestic abuser. Heard is countersuing Depp for $100 million. She wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post back in 2018 after their divorce about being a domestic abuse survivor. Uh, Heard never mentioned Depp by name, but his lawyers argued it was clear the piece was about him and that it ruined his reputation. Guad Venegas is been, has been following all of this for us. Uh, Guad, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, Tom, uh, this is the first time we hear these details from the doctor in this uh, video, the deposition of Dr. Anderson. Very interesting uh, because she would look at her notes and also talk from a recollection of these sessions that she had with a couple years ago, uh, talking about a lot of the things that triggered these arguments. So of course, this would be according to what the couple told her. She talked about Amber Heard admitting that she was triggered whenever she felt disrespected by Johnny Depp and also whenever Johnny Depp would try to leave an argument. Uh, according to the doctor, Amber Heard her admitted to physically striking Johnny Depp when she felt disrespected. Now, she also talked about an incident where Amber Heard uh, had sent her a photo uh, showing bruises and later came in person and showed her those bruises. Now, again, as you mentioned, the doctor did say that the couple had bad communication skills and they were in a mutually abusive relationship, also adding that the communication was so bad that during these sessions, Amber Heard would often interrupt Johnny Depp, uh, even using the words that she spoke uh, like a jackhammer or like rapid fire so they had to work a lot on the on this communication once again uh, the doctor saying that they were in this mutually abusive relationship okay we also heard from Heard's former assistant and she had a lot of details about her old boss what kind of insights did she office offer into uh, Depp and Heard's relationship Right, uh, Tom. So Kate James, who uh, worked uh, for some time with Amber Heard as her assistant, now shared a lot of details of her relationship with Amber Heard. Let's be clear, she didn't share many details of the relationship itself that Johnny Depp and Amber Heard had, uh, but we learned a lot about what uh, James said was the way Amber Heard treated her. Uh, she said that Amber Heard was verbally abusive in several locations. Uh, she also said she was often intoxicated. Uh, she recalled an incident where she said Amber Heard was yelling at her uh, so close, only a few inches away, that she was spitting uh, in her face. And James uh, also added that she did not believe uh, that Johnny Depp mistreated uh, Amber Heard. Okay, Guad, thank you. Guad Venegas, appreciate it. You know, when we talk about scams, we think of people lifting credit card numbers or those fake IRS calls. But a new big cyber crime is popping up in people's personal lives through popular dating apps. NBC News took an exclusive look at how scammers are using online romance to convince people to allegedly invest in or trade in cryptocurrency, saying you can make a bunch of money overnight. But the catch here, the money you're sending is not actually an investment. It's going into the scammer's wallet, of course. So think Tinder swindler or crypto or something of that nature. One man who NBC News interviewed said he lost $1.8 million, his entire life saving. The FBI Internet Crime Complaint Center said it received over 4,300 complaints in just seven months last year, losses totaling $429 million. So how does the FBI track these guys? NBC's Pete Williams is here now with some of that. Pete, so these scammers are hitting people, and they're vulnerable, right? They're looking for dates. They're in that kind of a position where they're a little bit desperate for their, for their love life. Presumably, that's why they're being preyed upon. Yeah, this is actually a very clever scam because it's not like they're just calling you up on the phone and trying to get you to invest in something. It starts out very gently. They, there's a lot of social engineering that goes on here. These scammers look at a person's background, their social media, find out what they're interested in, then meet up people on dating apps, say, you know, hey, I'm interested in fly fishing too. I, I like to travel too. And after a while, then finally say, you know what, I have a cousin who just made a bundle in bitcoins, maybe you ought to, maybe you should think about that. And here's the website he used. And that's the way it works. And of course, the website they offer is a phony. The second part of this, that's the first part of a scam. The second part is this. There's a little bit of salting the mine here. The, you put some money in 
and then you can take it back out again and you think, hey, this is working. You put a little more in, you can take a little more out. The more you put in, then you cross a certain, th uh, certain threshold and you can't get any more out. And they sort of fatten you up for the kill, which is why, you should pardon the expression, this scam has a name known as pig butchering. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, can you give us some detail about who, is there a demographic age group that's being targeted here? In other words, are, are these older folks who may not be as familiar with dating apps or the younger people who are, you would think, should be a little more suspicious? Well, as a matter of fact, the person we, we interviewed who's from your hometown of Denver, Colorado, uh, is uh, somebody who you'd think would know better. He's a software engineer. Really? And yet he fell for this hook, line, and sinker. He was recently divorced. He was sort of vulnerable to somebody wanting to express interest in him personally, and he got suckered into this. So it's not, it's not just old people. It's not just people who aren't too uh, sophisticated. It's, uh, it's, there's a huge demographic. It's sort of across, uh, across all the boundaries. You know, every time I've done these stories, uh, the, the law enforcement folks seem like they are just at wit's end. How do you even begin to track all of these suspects, but even the victims, because the suspects often are overseas, right? Right. Well, and many of the, many, these are the results of sort of organized organizations overseas that are doing this. I think initially, people who carried out crimes using bitcoins thought, aha, we're anonymous, we cannot be traced. Well, it turns out they can be traced. Of course, all the transactions are in the blockchain. Mm -hmm. You can see them. The problem is trying to figure out whose they are. And at first, law enforcement couldn't do that. Now they're getting better at it. The real challenge here is there are so many of these scams, there's no way the FBI can possibly go after all these folks. I I've often wondered, are there enough FBI agents for all the scams out there? No. <laughs> That's a short answer. Okay. Pete, thank you. NBC's Pete Williams. Uh, as you can see, more of Pete's reporting is also going to be on NBC Nightly News tonight, 630 on the East Coast and in various local time zones across the country. When we come back, a historic warship appears to be sinking in upstate New York. What officials there are saying about trying to save it. Plus, this week's Meet the Press reports looks into inequity in the NFL. We're talking to Blaine Alexander at about how widespread this problem really is and what the league is doing about it. Stay with us. NBC News covers hundreds of stories each day, and because you couldn't possibly read, watch, or listen to them all, our viewer team, bureau teams, have done it for you. This is what they're telling us is going down in their various regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Southeast Bureau, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a controversial bill into law today banning abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Florida joins a slew of others trying to restrict access to the procedure across the country. The law in Florida goes into effect on July 1st. From our Northeast Bureau, officials say a World War II ship in Buffalo, New York, was partially sinking earlier today. The USS Sullivan's on display at the Military Park Pier. It started taking on water after a major hull breach. Now, the city's mayor says authorities are evaluating the situation. They're doing whatever they can to preserve this piece of history. And from our West Coast Bureau, California wants to ban new gas-fueled cars by 2035. State regulators unveiled a plan that would ramp up the sale of electric and zero emissions vehicles in an effort to phase out the ones that need gas. Those behind the proposal say it's a huge step to fight climate change. The California Air Resources Board plans to vote on it in August. Our team at Meet the Press Reports is looking into a topic that we've talked about a lot on this show, the rising questions about the NFL and its relationship with the black community. That's after two more black coaches are joining former Miami Dolphins head coach Brian Flores in his class action suit against the NFL. Flores accuses the league and its teams of discriminatory hiring practices after he was unexpectedly fired by Miami in January. The league denies those claims, but it spotlights the issues America's most popular sport has had as it tries to address the issue of race. Blaine Alexander is in Atlanta. And Blaine, you did a deep dive into the numbers on the divide between black players and the coaches in the league. What did you find? 
You know, Tom, there are just so many ways to come at this issue of the NFL and race. So the reason that we decided to focus on head coaches is because the numbers are just so striking. So let me break down a little bit of what we found. You know, when you look at players, just players on the field in the league, more than two thirds of them identify as either African-American or mixed race players. That's a big number when it comes to players. But when you look at head coaches, it's a completely different story. In fact, right now in the league, there are only currently three black head coaches across the entire league. And when you look back on the league's entire history, only 25 black men have ever held that position. So what was really interesting to me as we did this more than a month of reporting on the subject, Tom, is that this is a conversation that people are having, current coaches, former coaches that we talked to, people who watch the league and rated on its diversity. So it's certainly not for lack of talking about it, but the big question that so many have is why have they not been able to make meaningful change over the years, Tom? Yeah, now you spoke with the first black head coach to win the Super Bowl, NBC's own Tony Dungy. Uh, I understand he was critical of the NFL's yeah. Rooney rule. He absolutely was and was interesting. We talked to Tony Dungy about this because it was his firing back in 2002 along with another head coach that led to the inception of the Rooney rule that people were essentially up in arms that he was fired as coach then head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So I asked him, you know, what he thinks about the rule and why he's so critical of the league. He loves it, but he says it's time for the league to make change. Take a look. Do you believe that the rule was necessary at that time? I, I do think it was necessary. Yeah. I, I don't think we did it properly, though. We only incorporated the one aspect, interview a minority candidate. Mm. So, so it didn't go far enough. It didn't go far enough. Mm. And so, Tom, he essentially said that what it came down to in practice was just kind of a checking of the box type of thing. And since its inception, the rule has expanded. You have to now interview two candidates of color. It includes coordinator positions, GM. But again, he, other people that I talked to, said it still doesn't go far enough. And one thing I want to point out here is that the power comes down to the owners. It's not the league. It's not the league office. But it comes down to the owners of the clubs. They're the, the decision makers. And they say that's where the minds need to change. Yeah, and checking those boxes can come off as just pro forma. What is the NFL saying about, about its plans to address these issues? We know they're pushing back on the Flores lawsuit. Quick response to the Flores lawsuit. They say that it's without merit. They say that they're going to defend themselves and that diversity is the core of everything they do. But when it comes to this, they've just instilled a new, uh, just instituted rather, a new diversity advisory committee uh, that's going to look at hiring practices across the league and make recommendations. We reached out to the NFL a number of times for this story, asked to speak to some of those committee members. They said they're not open to letting them speak yet because the committee hasn't met as a group, but they're open to it possibly in the future, Tom. Blaine, it's always great to see you. Thank you. Blaine Alexander reporting from Atlanta today. You can watch more of Blaine's story on Meet the Press reports, race and football, how reforms fall short. That's tonight right here on NBC News Now, 10.30 p.m. Eastern, and tomorrow on demand on Peacock. That's a wrap for this hour. We'll have more for you right here tomorrow, same time, same place. Coverage on NBC News Now picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.